my name is Bernie Roth and I teach at Stanford University and I'm a member of the design group in mechanical engineering and I'm the interim director of the D school at the moment. Okay. Yeah. I know that you work a lot in prototypes. Why do you think prototypes are important? Uh, well, they're, for us they're a way of life and uh, when we say prototype we don't mean just physical prototypes necessarily. So it's just a way of saying uh, don't think about something for a long time, just do it. And once you do it then you'll have more information and you can do it again and you can keep improving it. So we think of almost all our activities as being prototypes. It's become sort of a joke. So everything is a prototype conversation, a prototype meeting, but also, you know, actual physical prototypes are useful too. So you have the notion of ETC? Could you explain? Sure. It's um it's sort of a uh, E stands for express, uh, T stands for test, and C stands for cycle. And if you put the letters together, it's etc. So we call it the etc. process. And it's a shorthand for a process we used with the product design students for many years at Stanford. And it means simply express means prototype, uh, test means check it and learn what you can from it, and cycle means make another prototype. So the idea is you essentially uh, design something or solve a problem by making a good guess at it or a prototype and then you check and see what you can learn from it. You make another one, you keep doing that until time is up and then you have your final solution. Interesting. Uh, in Europe it's a very big going towards digital prototypes. They say okay we should reduce the number of physical prototypes yeah. and go totally to digital prototypes. Uh, yes. What do you think about that? Well, it depends on the situation. It can be useful. It, uh, you know, it, a lot of the problems that people are dealing with now are not only just building artifacts, the experiences and things like that, they're a little bit hard to model digitally. And uh, the other thing about uh, digital prototypes is they're just, they're not the object, they're just uh, a mapping of the object onto the computer. So that depends on how good a model you have and what the situation is. So in some cases it's wonderful and it's less expensive, but a lot of cases it's very cumbersome and it depends. Uh, uh, you can get often a lot of information with just a simple thing we call a crap-up or a mock-up. Just a very simple thing and you can get a lot of information. But it depends. But if you have a very mature product that uh, you're always modifying and stuff, then it may pay to invest in a digital prototype. Okay. Who am I and where do I work? Yeah. That's a tough question, but uh, I think you want a straight answer. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, let me repeat my name. I'm Larry Leifer. I'm uh, on the faculty at Stanford University. Uh, my appointment is in mechanical engineering. I have the dubious pleasure of announcing I don't have any MA degrees, um, but I've been connected to the department while I explored other majors at the university. Um, and that's one of the special pieces of the place. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know that you teach in uh, ME310, it is a similar course to this series course that we have for mechanical engineering, and that you use prototypes a lot in it. Why? Why do we prototype? Yes. Prototype is, uh, it's a simple word for a complicated idea. Let me say in, we do it to learn. And we call it a prototype rather than a model because when model makers build something, it's to demonstrate their craftsmanship, or the quality of their engineering. They don't do it to learn. If anything, they do it to prove they've already learned everything they need to know. Okay, that's easy to say, you do it to learn. What's that mean? All right. So let me make an equivalence to the world of science engineering science. We do experiments. Why do we do experiments? To learn. So if you hear the word prototype and think experiment, then I think you'll get why we do that. 
Thank you. What kind of prototypes do you use and the stu students use? We use uh, a very wide variety of prototypes. Um, part of our program is at the manufacturing end of the spectrum and a prototype there will be an alternative way of doing um, metal removal or plastic shaping. It'll be very close to final manufacture product. And that's, I think, the version of prototype that the world most understands. It's a prototype of manufacturing. We're very much at the other end of the spectrum. Far from manufacturing, we're trying to figure out what to manufacture. So it's the concepts, it's the ideas, it's the user experience we want to have. So one of the trends in prototyping is to essentially build nothing but to create a kind of theatrical reproduction or production of what use of the product would feel like and look like. Now, to do that, it always helps to have something physical, even when it's software. And that's actually the cutting edge of our prototyping work now, is how do you prototype software? No answer for that. <laughs> Do you think it's possible to remove physical prototypes? In Europe they go to digital prototypes and say everything should be digital prototypes. Uh, the question has to do with physical proton yeah. prototyping versus virtual electron prototyping. Well, I personally prefer protons. I'm protons, you're protons. Shouldn't the prototype we use be protons? I think it has to do in part with what do you expect to learn from your prototype? If it's about, strictly about geometry and dimensioning, probably fine to use digital because you don't have human factor. But if you have a human factor in your pursuit of learning from the prototype, then I think you really should prototype with protons. And there's no reason to limit yourself to one approach to prototype. You could do several. So let me use the example of some sort of interaction process. So I whip something out of my pocket and we have a PDA and we want to get a feeling for how to interact, what it should be like. So if it's strictly visual on a computer screen, all digital, well, I can say it, it looks like as, as a graphic object, but there's no way I can get my thumbs on here and find out what happens and why does the cap key confused with the symbol key confused with the on-off key? That's a bad line of confusion. So I'm always turning the thing off when I'm trying to get a symbol. Okay, so that's why you got to get fizzled. You can do uh, a visualization in, in graphics, you know, get a better sense of finish and feel and color alternative, that's fine. You do that and then you do the physical and then you do the one out of a newspaper. You do all of those. And that one prototype would be maybe there I would summarize the comment. I can also tell you an extended story about CAD prototyping. Yes, okay. Please. It's a story out of our laboratory, Center for Design Research, uh, and the work of Professor Chris Gerdes. He's a dynamics and control guy. I said, what is there to prototype about dynamics and control? It's all math. Well, he likes to work do it, he likes to apply it to vehicle dynamics and control. So he's got major projects now to do drive-by-wire cars or suspension by wire and brake by wire and accelerate by wire. So all of the, uh, the apparent behavior of the car is computed. Wherever the physics is, we're hiding it now and we're filtering it and modifying it. Okay, so they get closer to the story. They finally, they were ready to build the car. All new, no standard automotive parts anywhere. That was the challenge. For six months, they developed a CAD model. Three different laboratories working together, one at Stanford, two others. 
six months CAD model. They came together for a design review. And at the end of the design review, they could not agree on what the design uh, should be and whether or not what they had was meeting their requirements. So they stopped. They spent two weeks building a physical prototype out of lumber from the local lumber yard. Remember, this is a state-of-the-art car and they're prototyping in Home Depot lumber. They came together again at the end of the month. They resolved all design issues within a half day meeting. And the message they got away with was, CAD could represent, but it couldn't be. It couldn't give them the direct physical interpretation they needed to make. Whereas a very rough prototype could do that. If you will, no dimensional precision put together with hammer and nail. That's a car? No, it's not a car. But it was a very good way to get out all the uh, geometry, the configuration, and what would be, uh, what those relationships would be when you had to interact with it as a human who would build it and mount stuff on it and uh, service it. This was specifically the frame of the car. Anyway, it's a great story. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, one last question. Uh, I've followed your MFV2 course and seen it, uh, and you use the notion of the dark horse. Process. And the dark horse um, metaphor comes from the world of horse racing. And in horse racing, maybe 10 horses are going to race, and people are betting about who will win. And the horse at the bottom has very small chance of winning. But if it wins, it will really pay off. Yeah? That's the dark horse. Okay. That's the idea that in some, is ideal because it would be the big payoff. But the, you don't know if you can deliver. You don't know if it can be delivered. It has some technical requirements or it has some feature and aspect you've never implemented before. So they said, wow, we don't know. We better stick with this safe one. We know this horse is 50-50 chance. I put my money on it and if it wins I get one dollar or five cents for my dollar bet. I said, if that's what you're up for. He said, no, I want two hundred dollars for my one dollar bet. Okay, now that's the metaphor. Why do we give that to students very early? It's essentially their third prototype. They will do a minimum of eight prototypes in, during nine months. This is like number three. And they've already begun to uh, define what they think the problem is and what the need is, and that's getting quite concrete. And right when they've got it where they think it is, we say, what if it was something entirely different? Build us a prototype of the entirely different solution that would really be the breakthrough of the dark horse. So it's, um, it's very effective pedagogically. It's effective in terms of preventing premature closure. It gives them permission, formal permission, to do something they don't trust. You know, that they're literally being crazy to do that. And we're, but we're going to reward them for doing that. And um, I don't think we've ever counted how many of these dark horses become the, the winning horse. But I would say in a majority of projects, the dark horse actually becomes the front runner. Because you now tested something you didn't think you could do. You found out you could do it. You, you learned. And now that you know you can do that, Let's go for it. And that's part of how you'll get the increase the chance of innovation because you now push the envelope. You have confidence that you can deliver uh, in this new uh, situation. It's just very powerful.